great pleasure for me to introduce Hannah Ostapska. Uh, Hannah joined my lab from the University of Western Ontario, where she had done her master's. And she came uh, all the way down to Montreal to the McGill University Health Center to play in carbohydrate land with us. And, and while she's been doing her PhD studies, she's been investigating more functional aspects of how bacterial and fungal exopolysaccharides play nicely or not so nicely together, uh, looking at infections in chronic lung disease. So without further ado, Hannah, can you tell us everything there is to know about Pseudomonas and Aspergillus biofilm exopolysaccharide interactions? Over to you. So thank you, Don, for the great introduction. Um, and I'd like to thank the Glyconet and ACS Carbohydrate Chemistry Division organizers of this webinar series for allowing me to present my work with you today. Um, okay. So organisms get caught in the mucus that lines the airways. This mucus is removed mechanically by uh, ciliated epithelial cells that are found in the upper respiratory tract. Any organisms that bypass this mechanism um, get caught in the lower airways where phagocytic cells can remove them in a controlled in, uh, with a controlled inflammatory response. In contrast, in patients that have uh, chronic lung diseases, such as cystic fibrosis, um, these mechanisms of these innate immune mechanisms are defective. So in the cystic fibrosis airways, the mucociliary elevator is, sorry, I just have to move this window out of the way, um, is impeded by this increased in production of an abnormal mucus. Consequently, organisms that are stuck in this uh, static mucus can adapt to the airways by embedding themselves in self-produced extracellular matrices, also known as biofilms, to which some antimicrobials can be less effective. Uh, the persistence of these organisms in the airways uh, induces vicious cycles of inflammatory responses that increase the influx of neutrophils and consequently their products. These neutrophil products damage the airways, leading to irreversible lung decline, which, which eventually leads to respiratory failure in these patients. We know that the cystic fibrosis airways are successively um, colonized by nine pathogens uh, over the lifetime of the patient. In adult CF patients, the most commonly isolated bacterium is Pseudomonas aeruginosa and the filamentous mold Aspergillus fumigatus. Co-isolation of these organisms is associated with worsened outcomes in these patients. And it is well known that this bacterium and fungus form um, biofilms in vivo, a process that I'll return to later in my talk. In vitro, uh, in most models of interactions between these two organisms, Pseudomonas has been demonstrated to inhibit aspergillus by the secretion of inhibitory small molecules known as quorum, sen quorum sensing molecules that have antifungal activity through either inhibiting the growth of the fungus, starving it for iron, or causing damage through oxidative stress. However, these inhibitory mechanisms could be less relevant in the cystic fibrosis airways, which have a hypoxic environment. And under hypoxia, the production of a lot of these inhibitory molecules could be reduced, supporting an environment of cooperativity. So if these inhibitory molecule or mechanisms are less uh, relevant in the CF airways, where these two organisms are co-isolated from, it could be possible that an another mechanism of cooperativity could be through biofilm interactions. We know that, oh, sorry. We know that the biofilms of these organisms are sim have a similar composition. Uh, in the, both organisms secrete exopolysaccharides that build these matrices of the biofilms. And with, among these exopolysaccharides are cationic exopolysaccharides that are sticky and can mediate the adherence of these organisms to surfaces. So on the fungal side, the, cati the cationic exopolysaccharide is called galactosaminogalactan or GAG. And on the bacterial side, this cationic exopolysaccharide that's produced by bacteria are, is called PEL. GAG and PEL are similar in their chemical structures. Both of these polymers are 1,4 linked heteropolymers composed of galactosamine residues and one other sugar. These similar polymers are synthesized through similarly organized biosynthetic machineries. 
To explain how we designed our experiments, I'll very briefly go over these pathways. There are three proteins of interest for this project. On the fungal side is the epimerase UGE3 and the, deacetylase a, and the secreted deacetylase AGD3. Whereas on the bacterial side is a peptidoglycan embedded PEL-A deacetylase. So coming back to the fungal side, uh, the UGE3 epimerase provides monosaccharides for gag polymerization. And both gag and PEL polymers are polymerized by membrane embedded glycosyl transferases. On the fungal side, oh, and these polymers are mod pro processed, sorry, by modifying enzymes that are located in different areas of these biosynthetic machineries. So on the fungal side, a fully acetylated gag polymer is secreted from the fungus, where it's deacetylated extracellularly by secreted deacetylase AGD3, forming a sticky cationic gag polymer. On the bacterial side, PEL is first deacetylated by a peptidoglycan embedded PEL A deacetylase prior to being secreted from the bacterial cell as an already partially deacetylated PEL polymer. We have several mutants in these, study, uh, in these pathways to study GAG and PEL function. So on the fungal side is the UGE3 mutant, which has abolished GAG production and makes no polymer. Whereas the AGD3, um, sorry, Whereas the AGD3 mutant uh, makes a fully acetylated GAG polymer given a deficiency in its deacetylase. So this is a non-sticky polymer. On the bacterial side, we have the PEL-A mutant, which still makes a fully acetylated polymer. However, it cannot be exported. And it, therefore our PEL mutant, PEL-A mutant, um, phenocopies are UGE3 fungal mutant that can't make a GAG polymer. So given the structural and functional similarities between these GAG and PEL exopolysaccharides, we hypothesize that they could form a basis of interactions between the biofilms of this fungus and bacterium. We investigated our story looking at both the fungal and bacterial sides. So investigating the GAG interactions with bacteria and the PEL exo exopolysaccharide interactions with the fungus. So starting from the fungal side, we took a two-pronged approach where we investigated for possible direct interactions through hyphal gag with the bacteria and possible indirect interactions through secreted gag in, uh, with the bacteria. So to assay for direct interaction, we first, um, with confocal microscopy, we imaged fungal biofilms, you can see them here in green, and added bacteria in red. We observed that these bacteria were clustering around the fungal hyphae, suggesting that they were adhering to the fungus. In contrast, with the GAG deficient strain, we lost this phenotype where the bacteria were no longer binding to the hyphae, which suggests that GAG was medi mediating this direct interaction between the, um, these wild type strains. To confirm that the loss of this phenotype was driven by GAG deficiency and not low levels of PEL, we investigated the role of PEL, possible role of PEL in these direct interactions with a bacterial strain that overexpresses PEL exopolysaccharide. And like the native PEL expressing bacteria, these overexpressing PEL bacteria still clustered around the wild type fungi. However, with the GAG deficient strain, uh, they failed to adhere to the hyphae despite the overproduction of PEL. And to further confirm that it's GAG and not PEL that uh, participate in these interactions, we imaged a bacterial strain that has abolished PEL production and observed that, or predicted rather that uh, with the deletion of PEL, these bacteria were still able to uh, adhere to the fungus. So, which suggests that fungal gag would mediate the direct interactions between these two organisms and that PEL doesn't have a role in direct interactions. We took a closer look uh, with scanning electron microscopy and observed what we saw with, with our bronchocal or confocal imaging, that the bacteria were adhering to the fungal hyphae that were covered in these gag decorations. In contrast, very few bacteria were observed adhering to the fungal hyphae that had none of these decor gag decorations. Interestingly, we observed that bacteria were adhering to cover slips from the wild type fungus in a gag dependent manner, suggesting that gag products could be mediating indirect interaction between these two organisms, as very few bacteria were observed on cover slips from the gag deficient fungus. 
So this brings us to the second part of our fungal investigation, looking at the indirect interactions that could be mediated by GAG products such as GAG exopolysaccharide or the EGD3 deacetylase. To look at GAG effects on Pseudomonas, uh, we first collected culture supernatants from the fungal uh, wild type and mutant strains. And we would expect that the fungal, um, that the wild type fungal culture supernatant would contain the secreted deacetylase AGD3 and consequently a deacetylated GAG polymer, where in contrast, the UGE3 mutant would only contain the AGD3 deacetylase and no GAG polymer, whereas the AGD3 mutant would be devoid of its deacetylase and therefore only contain a fully acetylated non-sticky GAG polymer. We took these culture supernames and we cultured them with bacteria, which we then assayed for biofilm formation with a crystal violet um, biomass stain. And we observed that um, in comparison to the native bacterial biofilms, the bacteria that were grown with wild type culture supernames had enhanced biofilm formation. And this phenotype was lost when these bacteria were co-cultured with GAG deficient culture supernames. And this suggests that GAG could be enhancing the biofilm formation by these bacteria. We confirmed our results with a bacterial strain that's defective in biofilm formation. And when these bacteria were cultured with wild type culture supernames, biofilm formation was restored to the same levels as that by um, native bacteria. And this restoration phenotype was lost when these bacteria were co-cultured with, with GAG deficient culture supernames. So together, these results suggest that secreted GAG enhances bacterial biofilm formation and can restore bacterial biofilm formation. So to confirm that within these wild type culture supernames, it's the GAG polymer and not the AGD3 deacetylase that's enhancing this bacterial biofilm formation, we obtained a recombinant uh, AGD3 enzyme from our collaborators at SickKids in Toronto and assayed it in combination with a uh, um, acetylated GAG substrate on our, the bacterial strain that cannot form bacterial biofilms. And as we'd predicted that neither uh, the recombinant enzyme alone or the acetylated GAG substrate uh, restored biofilm formation. However, this enzyme in combination with the substrate gave a biofilm positive signal, suggesting that AG3, AGD3 acted on this acetylated GAG deacetylating it into a deacetylated GAG polymer, which is sticky and can restore bacterial biofilms. So this led us to further investigate how this deacetylated GAG could enhance bacterial biofilms. And for this, we uh, imaged enhanced biofilms uh, with fluorescent microscopy that were uh, stained with an antibody to galactosamine. And we observed positive signal from both native bacterial biofilms and those that were enhanced with GAG cultures and GAG. However, if you remember from my structure slide, both PEL and GAG are composed of galactosamine residues. So we would expect that these native bacterial biofilms would give some signal. However, the in intensity of the signal uh, that we detected from the GAG enhanced biofilms was a lot stronger, which suggests that this GAG exopolysaccharide incorporated into the architecture of the Pseudomonas biofilms, forming a GAGPEL heterobiofilm. So we asked the obvious question, are these bigger biofilms still functional? And a main um, function of biofilms is to resist killing by antimicrobials. So we assayed these heterobiofilms, uh, or the, the susceptibility of these heterobiofilms to an antibiotic uh, colistin. And we observed that these heterobiofilms were still resistant like the native biofilms were, which suggests that the GAG in these heterobiofilms is functional or that these heterobiofilms just function just as well as the native bacterial biofilms do. So I've told you a lot about the direct and indirect interactions that we've demonstrated on the fungal side of this story. So what's happening on the bacterial side? And we investigated if there's a possibility for the bidirectionality that could be mediated by PEL in fungal biofilms. So similar to our fungal story, uh, we collected culture supernatants from the bacteria 
And this time we dialyzed them to get, remove all of those small molecules uh, that were those inhibitory molecules that I mentioned earlier. And we assayed for biofilm formation with the fungus. We observed on a gag deficient um, fungal strain that can't form biofilms that as the, the wild type fungal culture supernames uh, rescued biofilm formation. And this is something that we would expect. But in comparison, the bacterial biofilms that contain PEL also rescued biofilm formation, albeit to a lower level. And this suggests that PEL compensates for GAG in biofilm formation in the absence of small molecules. So in summary, I, I've shown you uh, the possible, uh, a possible mechanism of cooperativity on the biofilm level, uh, where I investigated both the fungal and the bacterial sides of the story. And on the fungal side, I showed you that gag from fungal biofilms can enhance bacterial biofilms, and these heterobiofilms can mediate resistance to antibiotic killing. On the bacterial side of the story, I showed the conditional enhancement, or rescue, should I say, of fungal biofilms that were deficient in gag. However, the main question in the story is what happens in vivo? Is it the cooperative or the competitive um, effects that dominate? And for this, we would need a co-infection model to study gag and pile effects in heterobiofilms. And this could lead to informed treatment outcomes and lead to therapeutic strategies. So I would like to thank everyone who helped me with this project, especially my very supportive supervisor, Dr. Don Shepard, all of our current past members, my mentees, uh, my advisory committee that's helped me through this project throughout the years. So Dr. Dow Nguyen and Dr. Marcel Baer, and of course, her pro project collaborators who we could not do this project though without, from Dr. Lynn Howell's lab, and even Aram's here today. Thank you, Aram, for coming. Um, and from Dr. Nguyen's lab, uh, who have helped us with all things Pseudomonas. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Uh, um, Sachiko for making it uh, to this presentation. She's collaborated with us on previous projects. Thank you.